prezentacja Halila Kegancia, like the Dark Matter Programmer's Guide to the Open Source Galaxy, and this presentation will be delivered in English. Okay, so I'll do. Hello, everybody. Dark Matter Programmer's Guide to the Open Source Galaxy. Last, last, the one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, let me at first introduce myself. I feel like I need to introduce myself in the beginning. I'm a software developer who likes traveling. I, this is, Poland is my fourth stop. Previously I've been to uh, UK, to Estonia, and I'm originally from Turkey. Um, I'm in love with the community. And uh, currently, I work, live in Biasco and work for a company called Pitney Boss. Well, the original reason I'm here is that my wife is Polish. That's why I'm here. And she lives in Biasco, so for now, currently, I live in Biasco too. So, scope of this speech, I'll be talking about why we should contribute to open source. How to find an open source project to contribute to, and how we are going to do our first commit, and if we still have time, I will tell how the open source software, free software, is changing the world, literally. So, what is this dark matter? It's chamna materia. It's a type of matter in astronomy and cosmology that cannot be seen directly with the telescopes. It's, we are sure that it's there, but we cannot see it. It never shows up. Of course, this is an analogy to describe a type of developer, which is called the dark matter developers, that those kind of developers, they neither has a GitHub account, nor they keep a blog, almost never really uh, replies an ongoing discussion online, and they just prefer not to contribute to the community. But this doesn't necessarily mean that they are bad developers. But I must tell that there's a huge overlap between copy paste developers and the dark matter developers. And they don't attend to the conferences as well. So since you we are all here in this salon, we are not one of these dark matter developers. They just don't contribute to the community, but maybe they would, they would like to, maybe they want to. If you make them aware of the community, if you tell more about the benefits of developing to the open source community. So, why to contribute to open source projects? First of all, consuming sources out there and not giving back is a bit unfair. Not a bit, it's quite unfair. Like you cannot just consume everything out there and not give back. That's not good. And the people that you really enjoy gonna working with, they don't care about your CV or your LinkedIn account. In our IT domain, we are not our CVs or LinkedIn accounts, but we are what we code. So, CV or LinkedIn out, open source contribution, and your GitHub account in. So, by meaning, by when we talk about open source contribution, we don't, it's, it's not limited to app source code generation and distribution. This was written in the web page of this open source days. Indeed, it's not limited to. There are many ways that we can be, uh, we can offer our help to the community. We can give localization support. We can um, translate our uh, best open source application software to Polish, for example. For example, we can blog about our experience. We can write an article on code project about the problem that we overcame recently. We can answer questions on Stack Overflow that we are uh, expert on, and also we can even manage the community pages, wiki pages, and this kind of um, uh, online presence of our uh, open source uh, projects. So, why else we would like to, uh, to contribute? Because we have to build an online presence to ourselves, to not to end up developing line of business applications or enterprise applications in the rest of our lives. Because we have to prove that we are good on that 
but not with our CDs or LinkedIn accounts, but with our uh, open source contribution. And of course, while we are doing this all contribution stuff, we are gonna meet amazing like-minded people because we all like the same software, right? So we are gonna have some other common interests. And why to, why to contribute? Why not? We, we should develop our skills and keep ourselves in shape all the time. Okay, now, if we are convinced now that we all need to, should contribute, how we are gonna do it? While we are programming, while we are coding, we always uh, break down the problems into smaller pieces, right? So we are gonna do the same here. We are gonna divide this problem into smaller pieces. The first piece is finding the open source project. The second is getting familiar with it, and then contribution. Let's look at how we can find open source project to contribute. Well, if we think about the tools, the uh, mobile applications or web applications that we use daily, most of them are like already open source. Like, I'm almost sure that every, every one of you are using daily, like at least 50% of the uh, software that you use are open source. So if you already use a software, that if you are already using that tool, why not to contribute it? It's gonna keep us more motivated to continue contribution because we are using it and why not make it better? But not, not always we are familiar with the technology stack that we are using uh, our open source tools daily. If you are not familiar with that, we can just go and find another one uh, associating with our uh, ex experience. So the first place I would like to talk about is called allout.net. They have indexed 662,000 open source projects. They're crawling uh, these projects through GitHub, through Kotlin, through SourceForge, through a lot of so, uh, source code hosting place, and they have like over half a million projects. You can filter them by the language of your choice, you can uh, see the uh, activity, and so on. It's a great place. It's, everything is there, but not all of the projects are actively developed, of course. And the second one is openedge.org. This place, these guys are like, this is a volunteer organization that, that aims uh, matching the software so contributors with the projects. It's a great place, they are doing nice things, and they are like uh, categorizing the stuff with the number of bugs, the language, uh, with the toughness, and so on. They are handily created, they, they have only 834 projects. And if you are gonna open source your project, or already open source your own uh, project, you can uh, contact with them. The third one is for specific for new contributors, up for grabs.net. This place is also nice. They are all, uh, created by hand and you can uh, filter by text. And they, all, these, all of these projects here have very nice uh, contributor guidelines, documentation and so on. So it's quite convenient for people who are uh, just jumping into the open source universe. The next one is codetries.com. And they, these guys are also uh, categorizing, sorry, Categorizing the projects depending on uh, the uh, repos needing the most help. These are the ones that have most open bugs and most issues. And there are about 1,028 open source repos there with 3,300 3, developers are working. So we can go ahead and look. Uh, we can filter them with the um, programming language that they are using. So. Uh, we can uh, offer our, our help to these projects. The next one is my personal favorite. is GitHub's showcases. They recently introduced this. It wasn't there before. It's just great. Just go ahead and look for it. They are categorizing the projects depending on the type of the uh, problem they are solving. About security, about 3D modeling. It's just nicely categorized. Just go ahead and take a look at here. Probably you are aware of this GitHub's uh, showcase already, but I just want to tell you one more time. And the third one, the last one, is uh, Microsoft's 
uh, open source co uh, open source project hosting place called Plex. Well, if you are more like a .NET person, if you are a C# -sharp developer, developer, you can find a lot of projects here as well. Well, some people, like, not some people, most of the people who likes open source projects uh, that I meet, at least. When I talk about Microsoft, when I talk about the Microsoft effort on open source, they just escape. They don't like Microsoft. <coughs> I'm almost sure that maybe half of this salon doesn't like Microsoft also. When I ask them why you don't like them, they say, Microsoft killed my puppy. Microsoft didn't kill your puppy, man. They are trying to do good stuff. They are trying to do, uh, they are trying to promote open source, and they open source a lot of stuff recently. So you can uh, go ahead and you can uh, take a look at this code place as well. So say we found our project, now we have to get familiar with that project before contribution, of course. The first thing we have to do is to read these contributor guidelines and documentation if there is one. If there is no documentation, no guidelines, nothing, I suggest you not to waste your time to get into those, that project. Their onboarding process is going to be very tough for you. And uh, it means that they don't really care uh, about the new contributors, which they should. So if you're going to open source your project, you have to write a nice contributor guidelines and documentation for the newcomers. Otherwise, people will, will escape. The second thing we are doing is getting the repository and set, setting up our environment. Then we have to build it. And most of the projects on GitHub or uh, on Codeplex or in other places, they have this uh, section uh, telling you uh, which prerequisites you have to install, uh, how we are going to build your, the project through source code. And next thing is about uh, learning the, uh, getting familiar with the architectural patterns that project is using or frameworks. So for example, if a project is telling you that they are using dependency injection and you don't have any idea what dependency injection is, then you are going to have a hard time uh, getting familiar with that project. So at first, you have to go ahead and study the uh, architectural patterns, framework, before trying to contribute. And the best way, in my opinion, to learn a large code base is debugging it. Uh, when you pick up a bug and you, you try to solve that bug, solve this issue, you're going to uh, get familiar how the collaborating classes are working with each other, how they are communicating, and so on. And the other way to get familiar with large code bases is by checking the unit tests. It's also great if there, is, if there, is, if there are unit tests, of course, which there should. And uh, if you uh, go away with this uh, debugging and checking the unit tests, you will, um, you will be uh, able to get familiar with the project quickly. And the last thing is contribution. Now, we are going to contribute. The minimum thing that we can be uh, helpful to a project, when a open source project is raising an issue. Well, this is the least minimum thing that we can offer our help. Like, you are using your, this tool daily, this open source project, you, you've seen a, a bug there, just go ahead and raise an issue, contact with the contrib uh, contributors, and open this issue to be uh, solved. And the next thing we can pick uh, bugs, issues, or tasks which are already uh, listed and which are already pending. The third thing we can do is suggesting new features. And uh, then we can port the code, change it, then do a pull request that, okay, hey, I'm here, I implement this place, so uh, please uh, pull my code. And uh, while we are contributing, the thing what we should uh, care about is the following the coding guidelines and keeping things tidy and write documentation and uh, unit tests. Otherwise, if this um, project is 
has uh, a lot of contributors and if everybody uh, is following another way to while contributing, things will get messy very, very quickly. So we have to keep things tidy, especially in the open source project. So, and also you have to welcome the new contributors. If somebody's trying to join, just welcome, just give a warm welcome and just uh, encourage them to uh, get you, to take them on board. And while suggesting a future, you can uh, use mockups and some uh, design, uh, you can visualize your uh, suggested future. So otherwise discussing the new, new design aspects and so on without mockups is very hard. Just be, is trying to describe the text on the discussion board is not easy. So we should use mocking up. And <laughs> for those who are, uh, okay, everybody, tell, everybody talk about GitHub and Git and how, to, uh, how it's changing the open source movement and everything. But there might be some people who are not familiar with the terminal. Well, or even you are very familiar, there's a very nice thing I would like to talk about. It's called Source 3. It's a product from Atlassian, and it's a very nice uh, visualization of your GitHub activity. Uh, Git activity, sorry. You can see how the brands are merged, how the, uh, where, where they are uh, branched, the differences between commits, and so on. It's a great tool. I just, uh, it's, it's totally free, and maybe it's the only total free uh, product of Atlassian. And I just love it. I want to, I just wanted to mention it here as well. It's gonna, uh, even though you love terminal and the command line, you can give it this a try. <clears throat> okay, finally, I would like to take your attention to a very important point. How our open source contribution can change the world. Well, the country that I come from, Turkey, Turcia, recently, the prime minister of the country blocked access to Twitter and YouTube. So these people think that they can block internet. I mean, this, they don't have any idea how the internet works. They don't, they are living in the 19th century mentally and trying to manage the 21st century, which is the internet and the open source era. Well, after these blocks and bans, interesting things start to happen. Well, I'm sure that you are familiar with these numbers, right? These are Google's uh, DNS uh, addresses. They are painted on the streets of Turkey to tell everybody how to work around this uh, YouTube and Twitter blog. 888-8844, the alternate, alternative in Turkish. So, and the day that the Twitter, ban uh, Twitter is banned, people, even they tweeted more than a regular day, you know? These blue ones are showing the uh, number of tweets after the Twitter ban, and the red ones was before the Twitter ban in a regular day. You see how dramatically increased. People found a way to work around this problem. Then, it's not over yet. The government and the prime minister went evil. They even spoofed the free and public DNSs, and it was not possible to access to any of these blog pages uh, via changing the DNS anymore. And so even my grandpa and even the kids who are like eight years old knew how to change it, but now it's also blocked. They are, they are doing some DNS poisoning kind of thing, and they are trying to take away your freedom. You know, probably none of you here had to change the DNS number to work around the blocking problem. Uh, it's like somebody's trying to take away your freedom, you know? It's, it's, it's hurting. It's like being in a um, digital prison in the era of internet. But it's not over. Then people start to use open source software to work around, to get rid of these uh, ridiculous blocks. They, they start to use uh, open source VPN uh, software, like mobile applications, uh, 
browser ex extensions and so on. They, are, they were all open source and free, and they are now distributed birds are shipping onto the dictator. So if you if you want to uh, make a change, if you want to make this world a better place to live, please contribute to open source projects. Thank you.